that is the end to questions to the Minister of Education. And we now move on to the Minister for uh, Employment and Learning. And again, we start with topical questions. And I call George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can the Minister state whether he will fully fund the BA commercial pilot training degree for Northern Ireland students, uh, which was the situation with a constituent of mine recently? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the member for his question. It's a matter he's been in correspondence uh, with myself and my officials on. Um, the member will appreciate that um, we do fund uh, courses uh, within uh, the, the UK, but whenever we have a situation where part of a course is funded uh, or, or takes place outside the UK, there's a different funding regime in place uh, for that. The overall uh, student support settlement, uh, as agreed by the executive, is now in place uh, through to 2015, so, though we can, of course, look at changes thereafter in that regard. I call George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give me an assurance that he will pursue equality of funding with the rest of the United Kingdom to, pre to prevent further disparity for Northern Ireland students? Um, again, what I would say to the member is that there are a number of areas where there are disparities uh, between the student support regime as applies in Northern Ireland and in other parts of the UK. But perhaps the biggest uh, disparity is the fact that we've actually uh, frozen uh, tuition fees at £3,500, whereas in other parts they've gone for fees up to 9000 So there is a, a fixed amount of money available to us as an executive, and choices have to be, to be made in that regard between what we can do in terms of, of some of the other elements of student um, support. Of course, we can look at all of these issues in the future, and um, in the, the, the context where more resources are available to us, then we can actually drive out more and more of the anomalies that do exist. I call Bar Barney McElduff. Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, about his recent skills mission to the United States of America? I understand that he met companies in New York, Washington and Chicago, but could the Minister maybe detail what support is available for companies which choose to invest here from his department as distinct from Detty? Uh, I thank the member for his question, and it's a, a very appropriate uh, question to, to, be, to be asking. Though I, I would stress we're uh, discussing assured skills later on under the, the, the formal uh, questions. But in, in essence, um, my department does work in conjunction with Invest Northern Ireland, and we have a very good uh, re relationship. More and more of the investments that are coming into Northern Ireland are being attracted based upon the existing skills of our workforce and also our potential to invest further in skills. And that's why we have the Assured Skills uh, program. So a, a core part of our trip to the United States was talking to some of our existing investors to make sure that things are going well for them, and also talking to potential future investors into Northern Ireland and showing to them the very bespoke, uh, bespoke approach that we have to investing in skills which is something that does give Northern Ireland a major competitive advantage in terms of attracting investment at present. I call Barry McElduff. Can I ask the Minister, following on from the US mission, are any follow-ups or further visits of that nature planned, maybe perhaps to other countries? Um, well, at this stage, there are no formal trips that are diaried um, at, at present, though, of course, I do anticipate uh, that there would be some follow-up um, missions, whether it's to the, the United States or to other parts of the world, to further showcase our, our skills. There were a, a large number of leads that we did uncover in our trip to the United States, not just in terms of engaging with companies, but also with, with government. Uh, and it is fair to say that uh, the United States government in particular remains very keen to assist Northern Ireland, and it's not just in terms of the political process, but also uh, economically. And there are opportunities, not just in terms of company support, but also in terms of exchanges uh, relating to individuals, where they can focus more on their skills in terms of experiencing different types of business environments. I call Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister to provide any detail he can on the uh, recently announced uh, theatre as part of the Cirque College in Bangor? Um, well, I'm happy, happy to do so. I mean, this was something that was taken forward um, by my department, so it's something we've been very closely in, involved with. Members will recall that this was something that was mooted during the, the last assembly, uh, but for various reasons, um, my predecessors in the department uh, decided that they didn't have the resources uh, to take the, the, the matter forward. Uh, we have... Uh, 
revisited uh, the, the, the situation and identified um, the capital resources available for it. And I'm very pleased to say that we have been able to make this uh, important investment, uh, which is good not just uh, for Bangor and the, and the wider Cirque catchment area, but also for all of Northern Ireland. We are investing in the future uh, of our economy, particularly in the creative industries, and we all know that is a, an important growth sector. But it's also hopefully of benefit to the town of Bangor as well, because they have been looking uh, for a theatre um, for, for many years. And as part of this development, uh, there will be a 350-seat theatre available. And while it is formerly part of, of CERC uh, and there primarily for the use of students, uh, the college will be making it available uh, for the, the use of the community. I call Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer and indeed welcome the investment in, in Bangor, specifically in a theatre which, as he mentioned, has been long required. Can I ask um, what engagement did happen with other community groups to ensure um, that they can make use to it and it isn't solely a, a CERC facility but a benefit to the wider community and meets the community specification? Uh, again, that's a, a useful uh, issue to, to explore. This is something that uh, is going to be taken forward uh, over the, the coming months. First of all, this is something we expect uh, to be delivered in a f fairly short uh, time frame. And uh, there is a prospect of construction beginning early in 2014, and we hope this will be open uh, during 2015. Um, as I stress, the, it is open for commercial bookings uh, via the college, and uh, the, the precise details of how that will operate will need to be taken forward by the college uh, themselves. But discussions are also taking place with North Down uh, Borough Council, um, who have uh, responsibilities in terms of the development of the arts scene uh, in, in that community. And it is for them to come to an arrangement with the college as to how they could best support and facilitate uh, the, the subsidising some of the more community-based uh, organisations accessing uh, the, the theatre uh, facilities. We would stress that those are dedicated theatre facilities and there the will be of, of proper standard uh, and uh, it should be a very lucrative uh, venue uh, for a whole range of different types of, of organisations uh, and, uh, and the drama groups in particular. I call Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he could provide us uh, with an update uh, on his plans to review uh, careers. Uh, I thank the member uh, for her question. The careers policy is something that is held uh, jointly between my own department and the Department of, of Education. Uh, both John O'Dowd and myself are committed to a major re uh, review of careers uh, in 2014. Um, at present, uh, the, the Committee for Employment and Learning are finalising their own uh, review of, of careers policy, and we very much look forward to uh, receiving that report. In the past, we have uh, systematically gone through the recommendations that have been made uh, by the Committee in, in relation to other reports, and no doubt we will wish to, to, to do the same uh, with the, the, the forthcoming uh, report. I call Anna Sorry. I thank the uh, Minister for, for his reply. Can I ask the Minister what he believes will be his main themes for this review? Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that almost every time you have a, a, a deep conversation with the business community and indeed others around um, economic policy and skills, it more or less all the time goes back to the issue of careers as the foundation stone on, on, on which a good economy is built. I think one of the, the key outcomes that we'll want to see is ensuring that careers advice is much more in tune uh, with accurate labour market informa information. And while it, it is always for the individual to make their own decisions uh, around their future, those choices uh, should really be uh, informed uh, by the, the best information as to where emerging prospects do lie uh, within, within the economy, uh, so that people are fully aware of the, of the opportunities that are available uh, to them. In preparation for that, we are taking a, a number of, uh, of different actions and maybe take this opportunity to highlight the fact that um, we are placing our current careers advisors uh, in the industry at present. So we are encouraging companies to offer placements uh, to our careers advisors so they can actually spend some time with the companies and fully understand how they work and indeed um, the opportunities that will, will be there for not just young, peop young people, but everyone uh, in, in the future. And this is a, a good example as to how the, the public sector is working with business to ensure we're actually properly planning ahead for the future needs of the economy. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, my 
uh, topical question is also on the career strategy. And I just want to ask the Minister, does he believe that it's appropriate that uh, career guidance is steered in the direction that he talked about, um, based on the need of the employment market? Again, I thank the member for a question that shows that careers are, are always uh, something that's very topical uh, and, that, and that members' uh, interest is, is very welcome in, in that regard. And I think, um, to answer her question, I think we do need to strike the appropriate balance in that regard. We do need to respect that ultimately people will make their own decisions for themselves. They have that, that autonomy and it's not for us to direct uh, people. But that said, um, it's important that we do encourage people by illustrating to them where the opportunities do lie. And uh, whether we're talking about the programme for government or the economic strategy, or indeed my own department's skills strategy, we have clearly set out where we expect our economy to grow in future years. We know the sectors that are set to expand, and those would include, for example, ICT, engineering, agri-food, the creative industries. So there's a wealth of opportunities out there for, for young people. And it's often a source of, of frustration whenever we have skills shortages or skill mismatches. So we have a situation where we have sometimes high levels of unemployment and at the same time employers suggesting that they can't get the people to fill certain vacancies uh, because people perhaps haven't chosen the right type of subjects or expressed an interest in, in certain careers. I call Paul Bradley for supplementary. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and um, I thank the Minister for a very detailed answer and I suppose just to follow on from that if we could maybe just expand a little on how we make this more relevant to the needs of industry in general. Well, I think it's one where industry themselves uh, need to work much more uh, with the career service uh, and whatever future um, models we have in place to, to illustrate their needs. And I think the, the, the example we have of placing the career advisors with placements in the industry is a very good way of really copper fastening that type of, of, of cooperation. But Ultimately, what we're doing in careers has to be about servicing the economy, and that means servicing the needs of individual businesses and other, other organisations. I call Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the topical debate around the minimum wage versus the living wage uh, as, as is today. Could the Minister confirm how many companies uh, in Northern Ireland being aided uh, by his department are paying the living wage? Well, uh, I can't uh, give him a comprehensive answer on that particular point um, t today, um, and I, I imagine there may be difficulties in actually creating that information in any comprehensive uh, way in, in the short run uh, either. But what I could say to, to give him some uh, assurances is, first of all, we have spoken to the further education colleges and the universities, and um, they in, indeed um, are, are operating uh, on a, in a responsible manner in this regard. Um, the, the, we do pay the minimum wage in relation to um, apprenticeship s support, uh, and that is a reflection of the, the, the situation that pertains in, in, the, wider, uh, in the wider market. Um, overall, I think it's important that we are realistic uh, around all of this. Uh, the minimum wage uh, is something that is set at a UK-wide uh, level. It has been recently increased. Uh, I think there is a case for making further adjustments upwards in terms of, of the minimum wage. Um, in terms of, of, the, of, the, of the living wage ex itself, if we were to come in and to argue for artificially uh, setting a, a wage level much in excess of, of where the, the appropriate level would be for the national minimum wage, there could be unforeseen circumstances where we're actually denying opportunities uh, for um, employment or indeed for actually creating opportunities for, for skills and, and work experience uh, or apprenticeship op opportunities. So it's something that we do need to take a, a very rounded, a, a balanced approach to. But obviously it's not something that's simply a matter for this Assembly, it's a matter to be addressed at the UK level too. I call Rob Newton for a supplementary. I thank the Minister uh, for his, his answer, and I, I think towards the end of it, he did indeed touch on my concerns that indeed, uh, and I accept that there would be areas uh, within the UK where the living wage may be just more appropriate as an incentive to attract people. And isn't it possible that uh, in that attraction that we would indeed start to lose those skilled employees that we have and who are perhaps on? A minimum wage are better quality candidates uh, and be attracted towards the living wage. Um, again, I, I would just re reinforce uh, with, with the member, it is something we do need to look very carefully at, and um, there will be 
different contexts in different parts of, of the UK, and um, clearly th there are pressures, particularly in London and the South East, in terms of the, of the cost of living relative to what people are earning, that are, that are not quite as acute in Northern Ireland. But in saying that, I by no means diminish the, the very challenging circumstances that people uh, who are on the minimum wage often find themselves in. But um, it is important that we do have a focus on trying to create job opportunities for people and also training opportunities for people as well. Um, but where I think our ultimate focus has to be as an executive is in, is in creating job opportunities and also growing uh, and transforming our economy. And as we move up the productivity charts, we will see wage levels being driven up as well. The more we invest in skills, the more we will also drive up the, the average um, pay that's, uh, that pertains in, in our economy. So there are different ways in which we can actually drive up wages that are different from actually artificially setting a, 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 a wage floor. And that is the end of our period of topical questions. And we now move on to oral questions that have been listed. Questions number 2, 3 and 15 have been withdrawn. I call now Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. Um, when approached by companies, my department responds through tailored training programmes aimed at meeting specific employer needs. My department has anecdotal evidence that companies based in Northern Ireland experience difficulty recruiting some levels of welding expertise. The recruitment agency suggested this appears particularly evident in relation to offshore work. My department has worked with the recruitment agency for some time to establish the actual demand for offshore welding and, and related trades. As a result, a pilot bridge to employment programme was completed to recruit unemployed people with basic skills and to upskill them to work as scaffolders and pipe fitters. This was done on the basis of vacancies existed which the individuals would be eligible to fill. To date, the scaffolding and pipe fitting elements have been completed and those who have finished the relevant training are available for employment offshore. My department awaits confirmation from the recruitment agency that offers of employment have been made to the individuals. The welding element has proved difficult as arrangements for the provision of the relevant training have not been finalised. This centres on the identification of a suitable training provider. My department remains in discussion with the recruitment agency on this. Offshore welding requires high levels of precision and quality and certification to the appropriate offshore standard. The working environment also places additional demands from a health and safety standpoint. Where jobs exist, we will work with business to recruit and train individuals to work offshore. I call Sammy Douglas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Would, would the Minister agree with me that there are obviously great opportunities here in training and, um, and employment? And would the Minister maybe suggest ways of maybe bringing some of those industries together to try and exploit this? What I'm saying is about taking a proactive approach. Uh, thank the member for, for that. Um, and let, me, let me stress that we are being proactive in two different respects in, in this regard. I mean, first of all, I, I would stress that um, we are here to respond to demand from, from uh, businesses and, and the wider economy. Um, so we are not here to artificially say what work training should take place. We are here to respond to, to the needs of business. So our various programmes, including, including Skill Solutions, are there to respond to the needs of business. But we, all, we also can be proactive in terms of, of trying to, to plan ahead. Um, first of all, I, I chair uh, an engineering and advanced manufacturing uh, working group, and these types of skills are touched upon in, in relation to that. I've also asked my officials to conduct um, almost a, a health check in relation to our engagement with the renewable sector uh, as a particular subsection of uh, engineering and manufacturing to make sure that we're doing all that we can in relation to that sector. But I'll also stress that we do have a, a good footprint, particularly in the FE sector, and I would highlight what CERC are doing in relation to training people in relation to uh, the renewables, whether at the Newton Arts Centre or more recently at the, the Green Tech Centre that was opened um, at the Newry campus of the Southern Regional College as well. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister mentioned the lack of suitable training providers. Is the Minister aware of the work that the Belfast Met does in regard to welding and courses similar to this nature? And for also just not the fact that they'd be suitable for offshore oil and gas, but they'd be also suitable for offshore renewable energies as well. So there is a big market there that we can be tapping into. 
Yeah, I thank the, the member for, for his question. And, um, it's very much a case of just matching up um, the various training providers, which can be the FE colleges or indeed some of the, the private sector organisations with the particular needs uh, that, that are there. And uh, we are committed to working with the different companies that come forward looking for uh, provision in terms of, of upskilling to make sure we can signpost them uh, to the most appropriate area. But beyond that, we, we, we will also look to see where we can make further investments in terms of the, the supply and capacity of our educational system. Them, uh, to respond to the needs of business. I call Fra McCann. Well, well, the last can. Caller, several weeks ago, Minister, we were, our committee received a presentation from a group, I think we might call them copiers or something like that, and they spoke of the possibility of 50,000 jobs offshore over the next five to ten years. But like Sammy and, and Robin have said, they, they stressed that the level of training and education here is not suited, suitable to bring them to a level that will allow them to tap into them jobs. Uh, I thank Mr. McCann for his question. I think the, 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 the question and the, the original answer were very much framed around the particular organisation uh, that the member is, is, is referring to. And I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that we have to make sure that what, what we're hearing in terms of the potential um, is something that can be delivered and in turn that we have the flexibility within our training system uh, to meet uh, th those demands. And where, where we are is we're discussing uh, with the, the relevant recruitment agency to make sure that uh, we are matching what they're actually producing. To date, um, the actual practical demands have not been of the scale uh, that the member has so far suggested. That's not to diminish the, the longer-term potential in, in the manner the member has uh, outlined. But well, in terms of the current levels of demand that are coming through, they're not of, of, the, of the quantum that the member has suggested to date. I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank you, the Minister. Given the specific uh, uh, needs gap that's been identified here, has the Minister taken into consideration any special training for reskilling for those people specifically who have uh, found themselves victims of the recession, uh, and would he, be con would he consider funding that? Um, I thank the member, member for, for his question. And, I mean, if we broaden it out from the very particular issue that we are discussing here, um, we do invest very much in the issue of, of reskilling. And I think member, if members recall the situation that pertained last year in relation to FG Wilson uh, or Stroke Caterpillar, um, and it was a very heavy discussion then about what could be done in terms of offering reskilling opportunities uh, for, for those individuals. And uh, we were working closely with both Northern Regional College. BMC in, in that, in that uh, discussion. It's also worth stressing as well that often you find people who have been with companies for, for, long, for a long period of time um, and who were maybe recruited straight from school who maybe have not gone through the formal process of, of qualifications, but they are very competent at their, their particular skill or trade. And we have to find a means through which we actually get that um, training accredited. So it may not just be a question of them being reskilled, it's actually getting their existing um, knowledge formally recognised so that their skills can be transferable to other companies. Uh, question number two and three have been withdrawn, so I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I uh, ask for question four then, Minister? I thank the member for her question. Um, the additional funding is initially intended to provide colleges with the appropriate means to address the technical and personal support needs of, of existing students with learning difficulties and of students wishing to enrol. This extra funding will also enable colleges to ensure that the additional technical and personal support needs of existing students with learning difficulties currently enrolled on discrete, on discrete programmes are met. Colleges have been uh, utilising fully the allocations available to them through the fund. I am aware that in, in the past colleges have, have indicated that constraints meant that on occasions the level of support to individuals was restricted. The increase in the funding for the additional support fund, which I announced in September, aims to ensure that, that the level of support provided reflects the level of support required. The impact upon enrolments and increases in the level of support provided as a result of the increase in funding will not be fully known until the end of the 2013-14 academic year. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I welcome the additional uh, funding. But, Minister, can you tell me whether or not there has been any account taken of the proposals by the health trusts to reduce the level of daycare facilities that actually would have met the needs of uh, young people with learning disabilities post the age of 16? 
Um, I thank the member for her question. This touches on I mean, a very uh, broad theme that uh, cuts across a number of departments. And frankly, we need to be addressing this at an executive wide, wide level. We want to avoid a situation where it's simply uh, moving um, issues from, from, from one department to another, but rather we focus that this has to be a, a partnership with different departments specialising um, where they ha have the, 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 a role to play and are best placed to take issues forward. Quite clearly, the further education system has a major role to play in terms of, of people with, with learning difficulties uh, post-19, uh, post and there is provision in, in that regard. We have recently done an audit of, of that provision to see if, what, what gaps do exist uh, with a view to try and to, to, to address those. We also have the Disability Employment Service uh, under my own uh, department, uh, which is also being reviewed uh, at present uh, to ensure we're offering as best a comprehensive suite of interventions uh, to support people into and to sustain employment as, as we can. Um, the Department of Health and Social Services does have a key, a key role to play in terms of the, the, the daycare uh, facilities. I would stress that further, further education is, is not always going to be a viable option uh, for, for some in, individuals, and so that, that those day centres will play a, a vital role in, in this regard. Um, at times, there will need to be a partnership in terms of the FE system actually reaching out into the day centres and trying to provide some type of, of interventions and uh, training and, and education. Uh, to, to young people. Uh, but I would stress that this has to be taken forward on a, on a part partnership level. And uh, I, I would certainly encourage the Department uh, of Health uh, to make sure they're, they're investing appropriately in that provision. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister alluded to the, uh, an audit that the Department has undertaken. Has that audit taken account of two things? First, the numbers of, uh, of people with learning difficulties in the catchment areas of each of the regional colleges? Uh, colleges, and then in addition to that, the numbers of people with learning difficulties already enrolled to see if there is a differential in what colleges can do to attract more people. Uh, thank the member uh, for his, his um, question. Um, what, what I would say in terms of the broader context is that we have seen a significant increase in the number of enrolments uh, of individuals with learning difficulties within the FE sector over the, over the past decade. Um, for example, back in 2004, 2005, um, that, that amounted to 5% of total enrolments. Um, more recently, we're talking about 12% of overall enrolments. So we're, we are seeing a very clear uh, direction of, of travel. Um, I'm acutely aware that. Um, for a lot of parents in particular, the transition from, from school at, at uh, 18, 19 is a very difficult and challenging process, and many they're often moving from a situation of relative certainty to, to a, a, a big unknown. Um, I, I do think we do may, maybe need to do more to actually ensure we're matching our existing audit of facilities with uh, the underlying data that exists, uh, where it does exist in terms of uh, the, the overall um, needs within, within the population as, as a whole. But I think members can take some comfort from the fact that uh, we have seen a, a significant increase in enrolments in the FE sector over the past decade. Uh, but obviously there's, there's more to be done and uh, there are gaps in the system that still need to be addressed. I call Phil Flanagan. Gormau, that ask and I thank the, the Minister for his answers. Um, the Minister would obviously agree that one of the barriers to people with um, learning difficulties getting into further colleges is access problems and, and old antiquated buildings. So, in that light, could the Minister provide us with an update on the business case that was provided to his department for the new build um, campus for South West College in Enniskillen? I have to say that uh, it's a very creative uh, way for the member to, to move on uh, to, to that uh, particular um, point. Um, let me stress by way of introduction, at least, at least to give some respect to the initial thrust of the question, that it is important that um, we res uh, do invest in, 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 in modern buildings and that those buildings uh, are fully compliant with the needs, particularly of those people um, who may have uh, disabilities. Um, I think it's Disabled Go have done an audit of our facilities and and they're there to provide specific guidance uh, to individuals in terms of how they, they access uh, buildings and no doubt in terms of any future investment in the skill uh, that, will, that will be considered. On the specifics of what the member uh, did ask, I, I will get to that point. Um, he um, 
will be aware that uh, at present we have received a business case uh, from uh, South West College. That is under um, consideration. Uh, we are not going to be able to, to give a formal definitive outcome to that business case until the issues of the transfer of land are, are resolved. And at present, those are matters to, to be discussed between the Western Health and Social Services Trust and uh, Fermanagh District Council. Um, but it is something I do want to see happening, um, and um, I very much look forward to progress in that regard. But that is currently where that discussion, discussion currently lies. But yes, we have received the business case from the College. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. The number of students registered blind or with a serious visual impairment uncorrected by glasses and deaf or a serious hearing impairment have both decreased uh, considerably since 2007 2008. Will the Minister look at the introduction of support tailored specifically to these types of learning disability? Um, I thank the member for his question, and certainly I am aware of that context, and it has that, um, those stats have been commented upon by, by members. What I would say is that I think it is probably more appropriate that we invest more generally in support funds that are available across the board, and that the colleges have the flexibility to deploy them. Uh, but the, the, the particular categories that the member mentions um, are very much uh, within the, the subject matter for the, the additional support funds, uh, and I have no doubts or concerns whatsoever that those funds will be deployed uh, to support the, the, the individuals that the member has uh, referenced already. I call Cahill Boylan. Yes, I would a hold question number five, please. I am um, committed to North-South cooperation on areas of mutual interest and of mutual benefit. Channels of communication are well established with the three Irish government departments uh, with which my department has the closest interfaces, i.e. education and skills, social protection and jobs, enterprise and innovation. I and my department's officials regularly interact with Southern counterparts to share policy, good practice and to identify opportunities for collaboration. These areas include employment, training, further and higher education, employment relations and accessing European funding. The Employment Service has well-established links with the Department of Social Protection and shares policy and programme development on areas such as employer engagement and youth unemployment. For example, the Department of Social Protection is developing a contracted employment programme on a similar basis to our Steps to Success programme and is rolling out its Intrio service, which is a one-stop shop approach similar to our jobs and benefit offices. The Department of Social Protection also works with us through the, the European Employment Services cross-border partnership supported by European Union funding. My department is also fully committed to cross-border research and development, as reflected in particular by our successful delivery of the Strengthening the All-Ireland Research Space programme, which supported 12 major North-South R&D projects uh, between 2008 and 2011, and also through our continuing key role in the highly prestigious US-Ireland R&D partnership which supports collaborative tri-national projects involving both jurisdictions on the island of Ireland and the United States. These projects are focused on a limited number of priority areas as agreed by all three governments. I call Cahill Boylan for supplementary. Could I thank you and thank the Minister for his answers today? But could I ask the Minister to provide us with an update on discussions he has had with the Central Admission sorry, Office with regard to the portability of A-levels uh, for entry into courses at Southern University. Um, I am very much aware of, of those particular issues, but it is um, the member's colleague, the Minister for Education, who is leading in terms of, of those uh, dis discussions. The particular difficulty that seems to exist is that the, the Central Admissions Office uh, is uh, rather autonomous from the Irish Government. So I think the, the arguments have been won in terms of uh, Rory Quinn, the, the, the Southern Education Minister, and, and his colleagues, but is actually getting the, the system itself uh, to, be, to be more responsive. Uh, but the representations continue uh, from John O'Dowd, and I am more than happy to, to support him in that regard. I call Patsy McLone. Um, could I ask the Minister what conversations he has had in particular with the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development around facilitation of cross-border transportation for rural communities to access further education on both sides of the border? Well, those formal discussions uh, have not yet uh, occurred, but what we are doing is looking very much at the issue of student flows. 
um, ar around uh, the island of Ireland as a whole, and those links uh, are significantly underdeveloped. Uh, particularly in relation to, to higher education. But I would caution the member that the, the overall balance of the, the flows as they are, and as small as they may well be at this stage, are very much um, one-sided. Um, and they are much more in terms of southern students coming up to universities in Northern Ireland and also to the, the further education sector. I would in particular highlight the situation that pertains uh, in the northwest, um, where of the um, 4,000 or so students who come to further education in Northern Ireland. Over 3,000 of those are actually in the, the Donegal to, to Derry Strabane uh, corridor. So there is a particular issue in terms of the spiritual planning uh, of what would be FE equivalent in, in the Republic of Ireland, particularly in the North West, which is creating particular issues for us. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister uh, what work he's doing to expand the research cooperation that is happening on a north-south basis? I uh, thank the member for his question. And one of the areas that's worth highlighting is what we're doing in relation to Horizon at 2020. Um, between my department and um, DETI, we have appointed a number of Northern Ireland uh, contact points, uh, focusing in on very particular um, research areas. These are based within our local universities. Um, the Department of Agriculture has also funded one in relation to CAFRI and also in, in uh, Invest Northern Ireland uh, also act in relation to uh, small business um, and relations. This is part of a concerted effort to seriously uh, increase the, the drawdown that we have from Horizon 2020. As the, the, the Assembly will appreciate, uh, this is a competitive European Union fund and we have to compete uh, with other bids uh, to, to achieve this. The basis on which we do compete successfully is through building relations uh, between our institutions of higher education with our counterparts in other European countries. And in particular, we have the opportunities on the island of Ireland uh, to significantly develop the level of cooperation that we have uh, in terms of high quality international research. I would also highlight the, again the, what we're doing in terms of the US-Ireland um, um, Research and Development uh, Partnership and uh, doc, Dr. Kerry Ann Jones, who is the Assistant Secretary of State uh, in, in, in the, the United States uh, Department of, of State, um, is visiting uh, Northern Ireland uh, in, in, uh, towards the end of next week and we'll be having discussions as to how we can take this forward to the next level as well. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number six. Uh, during the period 2007 to 2012, based on the number of projects won on a per capita basis, Northern Ireland has been the most successful region in the UK after Greater London in attracting foreign direct investment. That fact was evident at the recent investment conference in Belfast. Working with Invest Northern Ireland, the Assured Skills programme is, is designed to help attract new foreign direct investment companies to Northern Ireland by assuring them that the skills they need to be successful are available here. Assured skills support is also available to encourage existing companies who are considering expansion. The Assured Skills branch is currently engaging with nine foreign direct investment projects, supporting the creation of over 2,000 jobs with a total financial commitment of over £3 million from my department. Assured Skills also manages a number of capacity building projects, which include sector specific academies. This year's academy projects include the Software Testers Academy, which is now in its third year a new initiative with local information and communication technology employers around cloud technologies, and a company-specific project with Deloitte uh, around their data analytical training academy. On completion, these academies will yield a return of 64 unemployed graduates gaining full-time employment. Once all employment targets are reached by the current uh, FDI companies, the salaries alone will be worth an additional £46 million per year to the, to the Northern Ireland economy. Uh, I recently visited the United States, the purpose of which was twofold. Firstly, I met with existing clients to discuss th their experience of assured skills and how we can improve the programme with a view to attracting more investors. Secondly, I met companies thinking of investing in Northern Ireland to explain the innovative support offerings available under assured skills. I'm optimistic that as a result of the visit, there will be a further assured skills projects in addition to those mentioned already. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer. Can you tell uh, the House Minister what you think uh, the future plans for assured skills are and how they contribute uh, to creation of employment here in Northern Ireland? Uh, 
I thank the member for, for his question. One of the things that has become very apparent uh, over the past number of years is that skills are increasingly um, the, the key basis on which uh, we compete for inward investment. That was very much evident at the recent uh, investment conference. It was very much a message I uh, obtained uh, on my recent visit uh, to the, the, uh, the United States. So it's important that uh, we continue to invest in the key drivers around skills, whether it's through the Assured Skills Programme itself or the, the more longer-term investment uh, in terms of our further education, higher education systems, and also through um, apprenticeships. Uh, I have no doubt that there will be many more uh, projects under the Assured Skills umbrella over, over the coming years. It is interesting to note that the Assured Skills Programme itself is still technically a, a pilot. Um, but it's been one that has been extremely successful, and uh, I would be very optimistic that this programme will, will therefore be mainstreamed in terms of the next uh, programme for government uh, budget period. I call Pat Sheehan. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. I wonder, could he give the Assembly an indication of uh, the type of support that is provided to small and micro businesses? They improve the skills of their employees. I th thank the member for his question. I, I would stress that we have a whole range of, of different programmes in that regard. We have mentioned previously the, the Bridge to Employment programme, which works particularly with those who, who are unemployed. The main service we provide is the Skills Solution Service, uh, which is there as essentially a one-stop shop to engage with businesses uh, to discuss their particular um, training uh, requirements. Uh, and we can put in place uh, bespoke, uh, bespoke programmes to address the very particular individual needs of companies. It's not a case of trying to shoehorn them into an existing programme. We can design something around uh, their, their own needs. I would also highlight that we are offering uh, management and leadership programmes at 100% cost, so they are essentially free uh, to those who wish to avail of them. So that again is a very lucrative uh, investment uh, and it is particularly of relevance to, to SMEs who are looking to, to upscale and we know that good management and leadership is, is critical in, in that regard. Also it's worth stressing as well that as we shortly announced the outcome of our review on, on apprenticeships, that we will want to see small businesses in particular uh, taking up opportunities in that regard. Um, it has been the case in Northern Ireland in the past, and it's also the experience in internationally, that larger companies disproport disproportionately take on apprenticeships, and sometimes SMEs uh, are somewhat risk-averse in that regard. So we have to have a conversation there as to how we can actually manage and overcome those perceptions of risk, and I stress the word perceptions of risk. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for the detail that he's provided in his, in his answers. Um, I'm interested to find, to find out more about how the Shared Skills Programme has, uh, what help they've, they've, uh, it's provided to existing businesses in Northern Ireland who are considering expansion. Um, I understand it's not just a tool for attracting foreign direct investment, and I'd be interested to find out the proportion uh, between FDI and uh, for local businesses. Uh, we can come back to the member in terms of what we can provide in terms of the very specific um, split between uh, current and uh, future, uh, in, in, uh, or sorry, existing companies and potential uh, investors in the future. What I would maybe stress in, in terms of, the, of some of the specifics as to how we're helping existing businesses is through the, uh, the academy model that we're taking forward. Sometimes we have to make more longer term investments in terms of our skills uh, to ensure we're meeting the longer term needs of businesses. But the academy model has proven to be a very a flexible way of addressing particular skill uh, requirements and that these are very much based around taking good general graduates or others with a good level of, of education and over a very short period of time through an intense uh, training and uh, turning them into people who are capable of working in businesses and we've highlighted for example the software testers academy and also the cloud academy and we had uh, yesterday the first graduation ceremony in relation to the data analytics academy and I would stress to members that data analytics is going to be something that we're all going be hearing an awful lot about over the coming years. It is a huge growth area and we are positioning Northern Ireland to take advantage uh, of the, the potential growth in that particular sector of the ICT uh, industry over, over the years to come. I call Thomas Buchanan. Question number seven, uh, Mr. Deb, Mr. Speaker. My department offers a range of incentives, financial and otherwise, to encourage employers to employ people, including of course people with disabilities. All of the department's mainstream programmes and services, such as Steps to Work, are available to people with a disability. In addition, a number of specialist services and incentives exist for this client group. 
These include the Access to Work programme, which supports employers to purchase specialist equipment, adapt premises and meet the costs of support workers, such as interpreters. The Department also manages the Workable programme. Uh, this support includes free and ongoing disability awareness training for the employer and their staff, as well as long-term provision of a disability mentor or job coach. The Department also administers the Job Introduction Scheme, a no-obligation subsidised job trial lasting up to 13 weeks. This enables the person with a disability and their potential employer to work together and decide if this is an appropriate job match. A new disability programme, Work Connect, was launched in September 2012. This programme offers intensive pre-employment support and in-work support to help the employee and their employer manage the early transition period and to agree longer-term disability support if necessary. Finally, following the introduction of the Youth Employment Scheme, a number of flexibilities have been introduced specifically for young people with a disability. The employment subsidy element of the scheme was extended to all sectors for people with a disability and the minimum 30 hour per, uh, per week employment requirement to avail of the subsidy has been relaxed for this client group. Thomas Buchanan for supplementary. Thank you. A Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. And no doubt the Minister's Department is leading the way in employing those with a disability. Can the Minister then uh, give us an indication as to what percentage of staff within his department have a disability? Um, I thank the member for his question. I'm not in a position to give him those precise figures, um, but insofar as we're able to, to do that um, without um, breaching any data protection uh, requirements around protecting um, the personal data of individuals, we'll endeavour to, to get in touch with him, with him in that matter. And that concludes questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments while we change the top table.